Well, tonight we're continuing our study here in the book of Joshua. We're almost at the conclusion of our study. We only have one more uh, chapter to do, and I plan on closing the book of Joshua next week, and then we'll embark on another study in a different book. But tonight we're looking at Joshua chapter 23, and we're looking really at a history lesson, because that's what you're going to see here as we go through Joshua chapter 23. He's going to rehearse for the uh, children of Israel, some very basic things that as we look at together, we can learn from. He's going to say some things to them that by way of application will help us to live our lives as Christians here in the 21st century. And so what we have is a reminder from history. We have a history lesson in which he's going to be com communicating to them some things that they already know with an exhortation for them to put into practice those things that they've already been taught and those things that they remember. So let's begin reading here in uh, Joshua chapter 23 at verse 1. And uh, I'll read to verse, uh, verse 8, and we'll get into our study. Joshua chapter 23, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for the heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I'm old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes. From the Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord your God has promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. Now, as we've been looking at Joshua, remember with me that Joshua has divided up the land, the land of promise, amongst the tribes, and he has found a place for himself to settle, and it's mentioned in chapter 19, verses 49 through 51, where that place was. And so he has found a place to settle, and he's been living peacefully now, and has done so for a number of years. Now, a great amount of time has passed as we enter into chapter 23. A great amount of time has passed from the initial entrance into the land. We know that as we've studied through Joshua, it took some time for them to conquer the land, and it also took some time for them to begin to settle within it. And so it's been estimated that when he distributed the land amongst the uh, children of Israel, that he may have been around 95 years old. We know that according to chapter 24, verse 29, at the time of this writing, he's 110 years old. And so he's lived a long life, which is why he's going to make reference to the fact that he's an older man now. And he's, he's nearing the close of his life. And because he's nearing the close of his life, he feels led to gather the leaders of the nation of Israel. And he's going to have a final meeting with them. So his life is nearing its end, and he's compelled to give them a final and a heartfelt exhortation. Now... You can sum up what he's going to say, and we're going to look at this in some detail in a moment and find some practical application. But the final thing he has to say can be summed up in this. Remain faithful to God. That's basically what he's going to say. That's the best advice he can give at his age. Remain faithful to God. Remain faithful to God's word. And remember the things that God has done in the past. Because remembering the things that God has done in the past and remaining faithful to his word is going to be the guarantee that God will remain amongst you and working on your behalf. And so his exhortation is very simple. It's very basic. A simple reminder of what God has done 
and an exhortation to remain faithful to him, to remain close to him and to follow him. So what he's doing is he's giving them a final exhortation. If you will, he's giving to them a final piece of advice, advice that comes from the mouth of an experienced old man, a man who has remained faithful to the Lord, a man who has seen, who has seen God's faithfulness to him. And because he's remained faithful to God, and because he has experienced the faithfulness of God, that gives to him the ability to be one who communicates advice to other people. He's nearing the close of his life, but he has the ability, because he's lived consistently for the Lord, he has the ability to communicate to them an exhortation that they ought to listen to, because he's proven by the kind of life that he's lived that what he is saying to them would be effective to them because it's been effective in his own life. Now, when we look at our own world today, we live in a world with no shortage of people who love to give advice. We live in an advice-giving world. There's no doubt about it. A nation that is filled with so-called experts who can, at, at the drop of a hat, give to you the advice that they think you need. We, we hear these advice givers on talk radio. We, we uh, read their magazines. Uh, there are professional counselors. We have afternoon TV programs filled with people who want to tell you how to live. You know, people as famous as Oprah and Ellen. You don't even need to give their last names, really. You have Dr. Phil and Dr. Drew. You have so many different people who are out there as advice givers who are telling people, you ought to read this book, you ought to have this diet, you ought to vacation in this place, you ought to drive this car, you ought to do these things. You know it and I know it. The afternoon TV talk shows are filled with advice givers. Or when you leave today, all you need to do is go and go to AM radio and they have a whole lot of people in there wanting to talk, sharing their advice with you. That's just the way it is. You can get on the net and the net is filled with sites that offer advice and information. All you need to do is type in your question. What should I do about my gray hair? And then before you know it, you just open up page after page after page of people who are going to tell you exactly how to do that. And they'll give you advice about everything that, uh, that you could possibly even question. They give you advice about things you've never even thought about. I mean, it's filled with advice. Or go on Facebook. So many people are, are on Facebook, and you'll see people who are giving advice all the time on their page. Well, you need to do this, and you need to do that. We're living in, a, in an era of advice. And so we have people who are wanting to distribute their wisdom to their friends. So the bottom line is, is you can find advice in many places. Now, Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12, uh, Further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. He's saying there are so many books out there that you can read with so much advice and so many things that people want you to know. So experts on life abound. The question has to be asked, how do you determine who you're going to listen to? How do you determine who you're going to listen to? Who's going to be the primary advice giver in your life? Now, Joshua is 110 years old, and he's exhorting the people, and he's advising them. How do you find somebody who is going to give to you expert advice concerning life? One of the best things you can do is look for those who have faithfully followed the Lord over a lifetime. Look for somebody who has a lifetime kind of, of uh, devotion that you can look at and you can say, this person here has obviously been doing the things that are being blessed by God, and therefore I'm going to listen to them. When we have uh, men's conferences, as we had recently, I like, to ad I like to have some of the younger men come and share with us. You know, John Randall, who is uh, not really a young man, but a younger man. Uh, David Zamora, for example, and others who are younger men. I like that because I enjoy their exuberance. I enjoy their fire that they have. And, 
and they give great studies, and I love these men. And the ones that I've had for our conferences and the younger men that I brought up here in this pulpit and, and turned uh, them loose on you are, are great guys, and I love them to pieces. But I have had a habit for the last 17 years of bringing Pastor Chuck to come and share with us as the first speaker. Pastor Chuck is turning 86 years old uh, in, in a few days. 86 years old. Now, somebody would say, why do you have that old man up there talking? Well, you need to put it into perspective. The first time I heard Pastor Chuck speak, he was 43 years old. And I was 20. And I looked at this old man who was 43, and I thought within myself, what does he have to say to a younger man? And so I began learning early in my life to listen to the men who've gone before you, to listen to the one who's gone before you, has the experience, has the knowledge, who's followed God, because they're the ones that I need to follow and listen. They're the ones I need to seek advice from. They're the ones who, who have a, a knowledge of the things that I need to know. So how do we, how do we find the person to, to listen to if we're looking for counsel? Well, again, we look for those who have faithfully followed the Lord over a lifetime. In Psalm 71, verses 17 and 18, it reads, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who's to come. When I've grown old and gray-headed, that's kind of hard to grow gray-headed today because you can just, well, if you hate that gray, what do you do? You wash it away, right? You can always, I mean, these commercials where these guys are in a bar trying to pick up a younger girl and she doesn't even look at him. So he goes into the bathroom and dabs this stuff on his face, comes out and he's a chick magnet automatically, right? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Still ugly, but at least his hair's not gray. We don't want to grow older. We don't want to admit that we're growing older. And unfortunately, for us, for those of us who are growing older, instead of becoming the leaders that we should, should be, instead of taking life's experiences and wanting to communicate to those who would be hungry to hear, sometimes we try to be young and act just like the younger crowd and lose the ability to communicate to them because we lose their respect. What we need to do is we need to act our age because I believe that, that the generation that is younger than ours, those who would belong to my generation, the generation that belongs to my children's generation and grandchildren's generation are not looking for buddies. They're looking for mentors. They're looking for examples. They're looking for people who can demonstrate with their life that the things that God says are true and, and they actually impact. And when put into practice, they're a blessing and you can be a blessing. So I encourage all of you who are growing older but don't admit it, I'm encouraging you to just grow in the Lord and be willing and ready to share your wisdom. Wisdom often follows um, experience. Like it says in Job 12, verse 12, wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding. So it's important for us who are growing older in the Lord to be willing to mentor others and to give advice and exhortation. It is also important for us to be careful whom we allow to influence our life by their advice. You need to be wise when you select somebody to speak into your life. Uh, like it says in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The, the New Living Translation says it like this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. And so the Lord has called us to follow the exhortation and advice of those 
who are walking in his ways. And so advice should be sought from those who have a proven life. And they should, it should be sought from those who have a genuine concern for you. You see, there are people who are willing to give you advice. You may be contemplating doing something and you go to somebody and ask for advice and, and they don't love you. They don't have a concern for you. And so they're not going to really give to you the best advice that is possible. Sometimes they'll give you advice that is poor. It's, an advi it's advice that, that they, they, uh, they think is valuable for you, but in reality is going to be harmful to you. And so advice ought to be sought from the ones who have a proven life and have a love for you. In Romans 15, verse 14, Paul said it like this. He said, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So goodness and knowledge and a willingness to encourage others makes for a good counselor. Now, they should always have a desire to advise you to follow the proper path. They should always be the individual who directs you to the Lord by his word. I have a picture I'm going to show you. I believe we have it. I'm not sure. If I had asked if it could be put up, and I don't know if they have it ready or not. Yeah, I just wanted to point this out to you. That's my mom who went home to be with the Lord about three weeks ago. This is a short time before she went home to be with the Lord. I want you to see what I'm doing because it's a picture of the advice I'm giving you right now. In my right hand, what do I have? I have a Bible. You, you can... Um, Put the picture off now. I have a Bible. I have a Bible that I carry in my back pocket. I've told you before, one of my friends said, always carry your sword, and, and he lifted up his Bible. He said, because the Bible's called the sword of the spirit. And then he said to me, look at David, if you can't carry your sword, he pulled out his pocket Bible. He said, then carry your switchblade. So, so I always carry this with me wherever I go. I've always got a Bible on me. I've got a Bible in my heart because I've memorized scripture, but I carry a Bible in my pocket so I can pull it out and give advice and counsel from it. That's what the Lord has called us to do. You ought to listen to the one who has the Bible ready to give you God's advice and not simply their opinion. I am telling you, that is exceptionally important to understand. Because when you have a situation that you want your footsteps directed properly, you don't want to go to somebody who doesn't have an understanding of the ways of the Lord. You don't want to go to somebody who doesn't love you and have a concern for you. And you don't want to go to somebody who's not going to direct your, your, your steps in the proper path. Ecclesiastes, once again, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. His word is what directs us. His word is what directs our footsteps. And so Joshua is beginning to advise them, and he's doing so by reminding them of the Lord's faithfulness to them over the years. That's how he begins. And he gives to them a brief history lesson, calling on them to remember. He's stirring their memory. He's reminding them of what the Lord has done. And, and that's a common practice, by the way, in Scripture for people to draw your attention to what God has done in the past. It's something that is important. You see it in the writings of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. I'm reminding you, I'm writing the same things to you so that you know these things. I want to rehearse these things to you so that they're embedded within you. It's like 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, where the apostle Peter wrote, yes, I think it right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. Or Jude, verse 17, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Joshua is doing is he's reminding them. He's reminding them of their history. He's giving them a history lesson. And he's reminding them of how God has been in the past and in, in, encouraging them 
to remain faithful to him so that God can continue moving on their behalf. So he's old, according to verses 1 and 2. He's advanced in age. He calls the leaders of the nation that they might meet with him. And he begins to remind them. As a matter of fact, he begins by reminding them, first and foremost, I'm old. That's what he says in the opening statement. Well, Proverbs 16, 31 says, A silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it's found in the way of righteousness. And he's saying, I'm old and I'm experienced. And I have something to communicate to you. You see, I've guided you in times of war. And I've guided you in times of peace. And now I want to guide you into your future. And so in doing so, verse 3, he says to them, You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. And so he begins by saying, you remember God's goodness towards you. You remember God's protection. You remember his deliverance. It is wise to consider God's steady presence on our behalf. And it's wise for us to remember how faithful he's been to us and the past victories that we've had in him. It's wise for us to meditate on the works that God has done and performed because those things that he's done in the past, he can continue to do in our present. And the things that he is doing in our present will prepare us for the things he wants to do in our future. And so there are times in your life that you may have to look back and remind yourself, has God ever forsaken you? Has God ever left you behind? Has God ever done harm to you? Has God ever intentionally hurt you? Has he ever done something that has caused you so much pain? And the bottom line is no. He has actually seen us through all of those times. He's never left us. He's never forsaken us. He never abandoned us. He always was there to protect and be with us. And so it's wise to remember the things that God has done in the past. You see, they had fought to take possession of this land. But he's reminding them, listen, yes, God was with you as you fought, but it is God who gave you the victory. So even though you participated in the battles, remember who is the one who gave you the ability to win. And remember who is the actual one who won and fought that battle on your behalf. Like it says in Psalm 44, 1 through 3, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own, own sword, nor did their own arms save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. And so the victories they had came because of God. The blessings that I have and the blessings that you have are not earned and deserved. They're graciously given to you. And when we understand that, well, we'll serve him with humility and thankfulness. So he's reminding them, God has done this. He said, the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. Verse 4, see, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord your God has promised you. So they have nations that are remaining. And the conquest is, being, is, is gradual. They're in the process of settling. But God is promising to continue expelling their enemies. And though there were nations that still remained, Israel remains separate from them. And that's what God has called them to do, remain separate. So he goes on in verse 6 and says, Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, and lest you go among these nations these who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. And so, what's going to safeguard them? What is going to make the total conquest of this land possible? Notice how he begins by saying, you need to be very courageous. Be exceedingly courageous. You need to live out your faith. 
You need to be people of faith is what he's saying. You need to trust God with all of your heart and you need to obey him. You need to consistently remember the things that he's done in the past because there are still things to do in the future. And as God has been with you in the past, so he will be with you in your future. And he says, be very careful to not be turned out of the right path. Do not be turned out of the proper path. Remain faithful to God and avoid the temptation to abandon him for other gods. You see, God's word will protect you from doing such a thing as you obey him. In Deuteronomy 28, 14, it says, So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. So don't be turned aside from the right path. Verse 7, he said, Don't even make mention of the name of their gods. Let them be totally forgotten. Let them be as if they had never had their names mentioned in this land. May it be that they will be like those that have never ever even been heard of. Now, why is that so important? Well, because if you remember those gods, you may become curious about those gods. When you become curious about those gods, you may begin to investigate those gods. As you begin to investigate those gods, you may be tempted to follow those gods. By remembering them, you're going to give an open door for them that you might be drawn away, tempted, and even led to worship them. Be careful. You may begin to swear to them as if they're the judges of your motives and your actions. You may begin to serve them in the religious rites that the pagans practiced. You may bow down to them as your creator and preserver. And then what you'll end up doing is giving your worship to idols instead of the true God. And so what you're supposed to do is detach yourself completely and finally 100% from those things. Forsake those things. Have nothing to do with those things. Don't even mention those things and pursue the Lord with all of your heart. You know, as, as I read the Bible, and I've been reading it for a while now, as I read the Bible, I never find any indication from the Old to the New Testament anywhere that God ever says to me, you know, I'd like you to follow me half-heartedly. I never see that. Have you ever seen a verse where Jesus says, uh, if you're going to follow me, that's cool. Follow me on a couple of days out of the week, but the rest of the week is yours. All I'm asking is just a little bit. For, I've never seen that. He, when, he, when he calls his apostles, he calls them to leave everything behind and follow him. The call of the disciple is for a person to, to change the direction of their life so that they, instead of pursuing the things that took them away from God, the call of the disciple is to turn them around so they'll pursue the things that are of God. And so you find that through Scripture. Uh, pick up your cross daily, Jesus said. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And so you never see an indication in, in Scripture that God has called me to partial worship of him. It's always complete. And he's even gone so far as to say no man can serve two masters. You're going to worship one or you'll worship the other, but you can't worship both of them. So what we have to do is as Christians is we have to make a determination that I'm going to follow God. Now, some people see that as so heavy that it scares them. They're, they're afraid to do that. But I, I discovered a long time ago that, that I cannot be 100% committed to, to two things. I have to be 100% committed to one. And I'm 100% committed or should be to my faith in Christ and my following of my God. That's what I'm supposed to do. And then everything else follows after that. I used to teach a Bible study here in, uh, in Chino back in 1975 at a house that's right up, just up the street from here, off of uh, um, about two blocks up uh, off of East End and um, Philadelphia. It's a, rock, it's, it's a house that's made out of rock. It's not a rock house. It's a house that's made out of rock. And, <laughs> and if you go by it, you can see the rock house that I used to minister in. And... Uh, I had a, a, a man who was there at that time. I was 25 years old. I had a man who was coming to the Bible study at that time. His name was Charlie. And um, Charlie had just committed himself to the Lord. And, uh, and he started coming to the Bible study there and, and grew un, uh, in that ministry under me for, for a while. Then I hadn't seen him for some time. And then I was teaching here as the pastor of this church. So years had, pa had passed and 
And, and Charlie came to visit us, and he came and spoke to me one day, and he said, you know, David, he said, when you would teach, because I was taking him to the Gospel of Mark, he said, when you would teach, and you read the scriptures that said, love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, he said, when you, would, when you read those scriptures and you exhorted us to love God like that, now remember, I was 25 years old at that time, and I was already saying we have to love God like that because that's what the word says. He said, when I heard you say that, he said, I, I could not grab hold of that. He said, I just, I couldn't buy into that. He said, I, I was a Christian. I wanted to follow the Lord, but that sounded so demanding, especially when you said to love God with all of your heart more than you love anything else. And he said, and I would argue with you in my mind about that. And I would say, I can't because I have children. How can I love God more than I love my, my son or my daughter? How can I do that? He said, and I would feel so bad within me because the Bible says to love God with all that's within you. And yet he said, I loved my kids so much. And this is what he told me. I'll never forget. He said, and then I realized after following the Lord for a while, that my source of love for my children really sprang forth from the love I had for my God. And the more that I grew to love my God, he said, the more I learned to love my children. And the more love that God poured into my heart in my relationship to him, the more love I was able to give to my son and my daughter. And he said, it took years for me to finally realize what had transpired. As I was becoming more devoted to my God, it didn't take me away from my family. It made me a better man in my family because the love that I started to have for God began to pour over into the love that I have for my kids. He said, so now I understand what you were trying to say. And that's what the word would say. You see, if you love the Lord God with all your heart, which no human being really has ever been able to do that, even the one who was commanded by God to pen those words. Moses himself didn't love God with all of his heart because he didn't even make it into the promised land. And as I've shared with you before, men like David, who God himself, speaking of David, said, this is one whose who's, his heart is completely after me. And yet, even David himself could not claim to have loved God with all of his heart because when you mentioned the name David, King David, there's always another name that's associated with his name, and that's the name Bathsheba. And so even David, who couldn't go outside and, and just watch the sheep without looking at the stars and thinking of how great God is, even David could never make the claim that he loved God with all of his heart. So I understand that because of the limitations of my flesh, of our flesh, that there will still always be an awareness of my own weakness and frailty and my incapability uh, of, of really understanding that to the depth that God would have me to understand it. And yet at the same time, I know that if you pursue the Lord on a daily basis and you say, God, today I want to seek you more than I did even yesterday, that you begin to mature in the things of the Lord. You begin to grow in the things of God. And it's more of God and less of the world through a lifetime. And that's how maturity occurs in your life, by simply seeking him on a daily basis, by pursuing him, and by holding fast to him. Now, instead of clinging to and holding fast to false religion, he says in verse 8, you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. They're to hold fast to the Lord. How do you do that? Well, it begins by holding fast to his word. In Deuteronomy 13:4. We read, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. We saw in Joshua 22 verse 5, uh, but take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, hold fast to him, serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. We see Paul in 2 Timothy 1.13 echoing that when he says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. You hold fast to the Lord as you hold fast to his word because God, God's word reveals God to us and therefore we cling to the one who's been revealed. And so by holding fast to the Lord and holding fast to his word, 
well, that will make it possible for them to be in the midst of evil but not be part of it because there are still, there are still tribes that, and peoples that have yet to be uh, taken care of. They're still there. They're living amongst the evil. Well, even as Christians live in the midst of those who do not believe, we can still remain separate. We're in this world. There's no doubt about it. God hasn't pulled us out of it. We're in this world, but we don't have to be of it. It doesn't have to dictate the way that we think. It doesn't have to establish our morals. It doesn't have to establish our, our, our ethics. It doesn't have to establish those kinds of things in our life. We, we can actually be livers, uh, those who live in this world, not livers as in your body, but those who live in this world, we can be those who live in this world without having to be those who are letting the world conform us into its image. When Jesus was praying in John 17, verses 14 and 15, he said, I've given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Don't remove them from the world because they're salt, because they're light, because they have work to do, because they're going out there as a rescue crew to, to, to give the word to save people and draw them out. I'm not saying to, to pull them out of the world. I'm saying keep them in that world. And so what God would have us to do is to cling to him daily. Now, he says in verse 9, For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take diligent heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God that you love the Lord your God. God is with you. God fights for you. God gives you victory. Love him. Love him. When you love the Lord, when you love the Lord, Well, you can do all things through Christ because he strengthens you. I'm wrestling with telling you something. Obviously, you see me sitting up there and you're saying, what's the matter? Did, did he lose his voice? And then somebody says, my prayers have been answered. No, I haven't lost my voice. I'm just wrestling as to whether I can share this with you, whether it's understandable. When I was 20 and I gave my heart to the Lord, I've shared with you how God radically transformed my life. I've shared with you how that some of you have been around for a while. You've heard this. Forgive me for repeating myself, but I'm going to make a point in a second. How that I didn't know how to love people. I didn't know what love is. Some of you have heard me say that before, and you've never really understood exactly what I'm trying to say, so I'm going to try and explain something right now to you. And it's difficult to say this, but I have the freedom now to be able to. I've shared with you how when I grew up that it came from a certain background, but I've never shared with you that my mom, when I was a little boy, for many years was an abusive mom, that my mom abused her children. that there were times that I heard the words, I hate you, much more than I ever, ever heard, I love you. And one of my memories is when I was about nine years old, my mom throwing me on the ground and kicking me, screaming, I hate you, because I had opened a door to look at some Christmas gifts that we had received, because the year before, we didn't have any money to get gifts. And that year, we actually 
got some gifts. And my brother Frank and I were very excited. And we looked in just to see, just to look at the packages, because the year before we hadn't received them. And my mom discovered that we had looked. And my mom used to get very angry. And she threw me on the ground and was kicking me in the ribs and screaming, I hate you. My mom was not a real nice woman. I didn't know how to love. Because when the people that you love the most treat you like that, you don't know what that word really means. Now, I'm not speaking ill of my mama. Everybody in this church knows how deeply I love my mom. I'm just telling you the truth. So for me, love, what is that? Women, you can't trust them. That's the fact. That's where I grew up. You can't trust them. They hurt you. And so I didn't have good relations because I didn't know what a woman's love really was. Because when the word love is used, it could be associated with all kinds of craziness. So at 15 is when I finally said, I've had it. I'm checking out. And that's when I began the alcohol. That's when I began the drugs. That's when I said, I don't care how you feel about anything. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not taking this anymore. It's a lot of story that I could tell you about that. But when I got to be 20, and I'd gone through all the garbage and the nonsense, and I'd ruined relationships, and I didn't know how to care for people, and I didn't know how to love, and I didn't know how to even say it, and I was afraid to use that word, that's when Jesus saved me. And when Jesus saved me, I brought this love of God home to a family that didn't know what love was. And I brought my mom to faith in Jesus Christ when I was 20. And from that point on, my mom's life began to change because mama needed to know what love was too, you see? I understand some things through experience that I have never been able to communicate to you. I've never been able to open up because I didn't want to do and do not want to do my mom a disservice by, by causing her name and reputation to be sullied amongst you because you have known, those of you who have known my mom, have known her as a woman who loves the Lord. I have always seen my mom as a woman transformed by the power of God. That's what happens when you cling to him. That's what happens when you say, God, I can't take it anymore. I don't want any more of this life. I don't want to be this way anymore. I need your help. God, forgive me because of the bitterness and the anger, the hurt and resentment, because of all of those things that were in my personal life, because of the, the betrayals and the hurts that, that our whole family had endured. But God has said to, to us that, that, that we can be in this world, but we don't have to be of it. I don't have to use the world's model of relationship. I don't have to use the world's model of love. I don't have to use the wor world's model of forgiveness and reconciliation. I brought the gospel to my mom, and I shared, you need Jesus Christ. And I brought the gospel to my dad, and I said, Daddy, you need the Lord. And I saw God transform my parents. My dad was a man who never said the words, I love you. My dad didn't say those words to us. My dad was a man who didn't show affection at all until he got saved. And when my dad got saved, some of you had the joy of knowing my dad. He was the most sweet and most tender man that you'd ever meet. My dad was a kind and loving man. That was the gospel power to transform a life. Because my daddy never showed affection to me. At the age of three or four, I went to kiss my dad goodnight, and he pushed me away, stuck his hand out, and said, men don't kiss, men shake hands. My dad never showed affection to me until after, well, he was, when I was 17, he showed me it once. He said, I love you. When I was 17, he just wasn't cut from that cloth. When I got saved, I brought a gospel of transformation to the family. And my mom, who was abusive and angry, my mom changed because she finally came into connection with the one who transforms lives. 
That's why you'll, there have been many times when I in this pulpit have begun to weep, and you haven't known why. It's because I'm remembering of the transformation that God has done in me and my family and his goodness. And I can sometimes remember the things that were not so good. And then I compare them with where they are, they're at now. That's why I could stand up last week and I could eulogize my mom as a gracious, loving, caring woman because she became that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the clinging to it that changes you. You see? And that's what God has called us to do. We can live in the midst of this evil world, but God has called us to cling tightly to him. We can live in the midst of a world that rejects him, but God can transform us. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, it's the Lord who fights for you, even as he promised. But take heed to yourselves. Love the Lord your God. That's what changes everything, guys. It's learning to love the Lord and letting him love you and receiving his love and then giving his love to other people. Now, he says in verse 12, or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Behold, this day... I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you, and not one word of them has failed. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all the good things have come upon you which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he's destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. So he closes with an encouragement and a warning. You see, outside of their failure at Ai, Israel had moved from victory to victory by just simply trusting in the Lord. The Lord had fought on their side and he had given them victory and he is now giving them rest. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The psalmist in Psalm 44, verses 4 and 5 said, You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. So the Lord has given you victory against these great and strong nations, cling to him. But if you don't, verse 12 and 13, if you go back, well, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to end up being judged. It's interesting how in verses 12 and 13, he speaks concerning intermarriage. Notice how he says in verse 12, uh, or else if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you. They're going to be traps and scourges. They're going to be uh, things that are harmful to you. But it's interesting how he's saying, be careful that you do not intermarry with unbelievers. I can't tell you how many Christian people who claim to love the Lord um, have gone out and gotten married to those who don't know the Lord at all. You see, there's no other relationship as intimate on earth, as intimate as marriage. So nothing is more certain to draw a person away than for them to fall in love with and marry an unbeliever. As a matter of fact, when somebody has approached me and has said to me that they want to marry, and the person that they want to marry doesn't know the Lord, there's hardly anything I can think of that more clearly exposes their lack of faith in Christ than that decision. When you speak to somebody, and I, I have to tell you, I've done it more than once over the years, who will come up and say, I'm going to get married. I can remember one conversation in particular with a young lady years ago now who spoke to me, and I said, 
you know what the word of God says concerning this. This man that you want to marry is not a believer. And she says, yes, I know. And I said, you know what God's word says concerning that? She said, yes, I do. And I spoke to her with, with, with uh, the heart of a father for a young woman. And I said to her, you know that this is not the man that your father prayed for you to marry. And you know that on your wedding day, it's going to break your father's heart that you're marrying a guy who doesn't love Jesus Christ. You know that. She said, yes. And a while later, she got married to the guy. And that, if there's anything that reveals your heart more than that, I don't know what is possible to reveal it even more. The one you choose to marry demonstrates your faith in Christ. The Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Ask the question, what does this light have in common with darkness? What does the devil have in common with Jesus? And so this, this New Testament forbidding uh, believers from intermarrying is not just a New Testament, but it's an Old Testament. And there's hardly anything that is more, in, is, is, is more sure to help you to walk away from God than for you to be hooked up with get married to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. And in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, it reads, uh, King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts af after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. That's what happens. Now, he's saying in verse 13, if you do intermarry, you're going to lose my protection. God's protection will be removed, and it's going to bring great pain to you. And then he finally says this, uh, I'm going the way of all the earth. I'm about to die. And you've seen and you've experienced God's faithful keeping of his promises. These are experiences that you cannot deny. So continue trusting him and continue keeping his word. And then he basically closes in verse 16 with not only a warning, but also a prediction. He says, when you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you. You shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. They'd already been told what would happen if they turned away from the Lord. But in spite of God's faithfulness, they eventually did turn away and they did go into captivity. In 722, before Christ, the Assyrians came and took the ten northern tribes into captivity. And then in 605, the Babylonians came in three different campaigns against Israel until they removed the majority of the people of Judah, the southern tribes, till they removed them and then the land became barren for those 70 years as they were in Babylonian captivity. God's word was fulfilled. God said, if you fail to keep my word, I will judge you. If you remain faithful... To my word, I will bless you. So this was not only a warning, but it was also a prediction, a prediction or a prophecy that was fulfilled not that long afterwards when the Assyrians came and the Babylonians came. So God's word has promises and God's word has warnings. We need to receive both. Not only the promises, which are so wonderful, but also to walk in the warnings which were surely, will surely come to pass because God's word is sure. And so he's saying to them, you need to understand this, remain faithful to God, but I'm telling you what is going to happen in your future. You will turn away from him. You will be judged. As for us, let's remain faithful to God.